Oh, welcome to gagrel.net. This is Gagrel Live on Facebook and YouTube today, both uh, both places. And also today we have our friend Harud Sassunian, the top Armenian intellectual. And today we're going to go into this disaster that happened in, in Yerevan and the lack of response from Pashinyan. And uh, so let's run this. Okay, Harut, welcome. Thank you, Wally. It's a pleasure. Um, you know, when, uh, when September 11 happened, um, people could not imagine, all of us could not imagine how people can take a plane and hit the, the buildings. I mean, it was beyond any human imagination. And so in Armenia is not, I'm not talking about what happened like uh, this couple of days. I'm talking about all what this Pashinian is doing. They cannot imagine how evil this guy is, what he could do, you know. And this is one of the problem all of us trying to talk to Armenian people understand. Um, so uh, let's, let's look at here a video Armenian frustration with Pashinyan, uh, how the, it took four hours, the police even to show up, four hours, never mind the, the other people, you know, and so people, they were doing themselves, I'm going to run this video first a guy who is talking do you see that the, the Pashinian man in there saying, well, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, you know, they want to, they want to shut up the people, you know, so I'll let you talk and then we'll run the rest of it. Well, I'm not surprised because uh, it, it's a one man show, he wants to run the show. At, and he wants to present it the way he wants to. It's a propaganda machine, which is something he's done not only the last four years, but the last uh, 10, 20 years. He's been a troublemaker, a street walker, and protester, so he's, he's used to that. He knows how to uh, deceive people, fool people, and unfortunately, a lot of people very innocently fall for that. And if you add on top of that, the hatred they have for the former leaders, then you, you got a, a w winning formula. So l let's start this conversation, uh, you know, beyond Pashinyan, we'll come back to him, but let's start with what the hell is a whole warehouse of explosives doing in yeah. a shopping center? I mean, anybody with sense Either they have to have a sense or the government has to inspect and not allow them to store explosives, uh, di uh, fireworks uh, in, in a shopping center where there are hundreds of people. And this happened on a, on a Sunday when there are a lot of people out. So it's all these poor people on the top of all the other disasters that Armenia and Arsakh have. Now we're uh, adding to it, creating more disasters of our own when there's no need for it. We need to solve problems, not add to them. So it's a, just a disaster all around. Uh, you know, again, in a normal country, uh, yes, accidents do happen everywhere. That's understandable. But the government tries to have rules, regulations, trying to enforce regulations. But Pashinyan's people, they're all busy with uh, chasing their opponents, the opposition. Uh, anybody who walks in the street and protesting, they, 10 policemen jump on him and drag him to the ground and put him in a police car, take him to jail. Uh, so n no one's doing anything other, other than trying to protect Pashinyan, make him look good. But, you know, if, if they were to do their jobs, 
and their job is to make sure the the citizens live a normal life, a safe life, secure life. And uh, now, now that it has happened, regardless of what we think about it, the uh, the next thing is, which I'm sure also they're gonna screw it up, is to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So you need an investigation. You need specialized people who are knowledgeable and experts. They review everything. Now, a friend told me that this uh, particular warehouse belongs to uh, one of the oligarchs that is giving money and supportive of Ashinian. <laughs> now, I haven't confirmed that independently. That's why I'm not giving the name of the oligarch. Uh, but if that's true, that's, again, not surprising. It's uh, sad because if you're a if you're part of the Pashinyan team, you get away with everything, including murder, explosion, all these people were killed for no reason. But if you're in opposition, if you open, you move your finger, they jump on you. Yeah. So, so n now I, I hope with all these people dead and injured, there'll be an investigation to see who did what wrong, what went wrong, not so much to go on to the past, but to make sure it doesn't happen again. This is the, but I have lost confidence for a very simple reason. There's a much bigger issue that, that needed to be investigated. That's uh, the war of 2020. And when it was over, there were all sorts of statements made by everybody on all sides, including Pashinyan who repeatedly said there were traitors and uh, there were uh, this, that, sold our land, sold our army, etc. And uh, so finally, because the majority of the parliament are Pashinyan's people, they control the agenda, control the decisions. Finally, months and months of effort talking, they decided we're going to have a committee and we're going to investigate uh, what really took place in the war. Again, not so much to go back and rehash the past, but to to make sure that we learn from our mistakes and next time there's a confrontation or conflict or war, we correct the, the mistakes. So that that's what they decided. Now, a year and uh, nine months have passed from the war. There's still no parliamentary investigation. Uh, we don't know what happened. Uh, the rumors are everywhere. Everybody just makes up stuff, and uh, there's no evidence. Not not that the parliamentary committee that is only com led by Pashinyan's people is going to be an uh, honest, honest truth-finding uh, uh, commission, because they can also hide things. And if they find one little thing on one soldier, they're going to make that a big deal. And because of that one soldier, Armia lost the war, they're going to say and not because of the, all the incompetent and ignorant decisions that Pashinyan made as the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the uh, military chief, uh, commander, commander, sorry, commander in chief, who was, was supposed to uh, be in charge of the military. And of course, when there's a war, you're also in charge of the war. And he had no idea, he's never served in the military. He faked a leg injury to get out of uh, the draft. So uh, he knows nothing about military, yet he was giving orders. He was interfering left and right. His wife even went in the middle of the war to Artsakh, got in the general command office, and was sitting there distracting the generals who were following every minute the war on, on the screen and sometimes saying things which she, she had no idea about. She had no business being there, and they couldn't throw her out. Uh, one general dared to say one little polite thing, saying, uh, lady, uh, men sometimes use rough language with each other, and you're sitting here, it may not be appropriate for you. And he didn't even say, get the hell out of here. Nothing rude like that. But the minute he said that, but politely, she immediately called uh, her husband in Yerevan, and hus her husband immediately ordered that general 
to be recalled back to Yerevan and leave the the battlefront, which things like this. It it it, it doesn't it's end. A, There's a million examples. He's a revengeful guy. I mean, there are thousands of videos. I don't know even. I probably have here something. Yes, it's a coachman. Um, patrastvel vreji. Patrastvel vreji. The guy is a revengeful guy. He's calling for revenge. I mean, is this is the prime minister? That's why everybody in his, his party is scared to death. To Like in every, like you saw in the United States, I mean, we're not going to compare U.S. to Armenia, but you saw in the United States when Trump was screwing up, the people were leaving. Even the minister, uh, secretary of defense, which highest job, he left. And they criticize him. Even Republican Party turned against him. They elected uh, Biden. But in Armenia, I want to see just one day some of th those thugs who is Pashinyan resign, say, you know, this guy is a horrible thing. Nobody is so scared. This is worse than Saddam Hussein regime. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Saddam Hussein because I was going to mention it a minute ago because I remember last year before the june 20 2021 parliamentary elections Pashinyan went around the country campaigning and i remember vividly watching the video in, in total disbelief he was on the stage giving a campaign speech and amazingly he had a hammer in his hand waving the hammer in the air he says with his hammer i'm going to crush the heads of the opposition I mean, that, that's when I remember Saddam Hussein, who uh, I think it was in his balcony, fired that gun. Uh, he was not even campaigning. But have you ever heard of a, any leader in, in a, the most backward country in the world goes on the campaign uh, with a hammer in his hand, threatening his uh, opposition? And this guy uh, wants to be known as a Democrat, as the people uh, man. Uh, no one does this. Uh, I mean, not even the worst dictators uh, uh, have have done that, have campaigned during elections with a hammer in their hand. Uh, it's just incredible. Well, he even, uh, he even used uh, Stalin word. He says, uh, I have, uh, what was that he said? Yeah, he said something like, I have, uh, uh, Ma uh, iron mandate. That's how Stalin, uh, his name was not Stalin. He used St Stalin in Russian is Iron Man. So he changed his name to Stalin, Joseph Stalin. His name was completely the Georgian name. And so he's using lots of Stalin words, you know, that, that when he said, I have an iron mandate, that's first thing came in my mind was uh, what the uh, uh, Stalin says, so it did. Well, you, you also reminded me something else he kept saying repeatedly, not just once. Once, you know, it's okay. We all make mistakes. You can make a mistake once. You can misspeak in the heat of the moment. But when you repeat it day after day, week after week, month after month, it's not a mistake. It's intentional. He, he yeah. kept telling his opposition again, I'm going to flatten you to the ground. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to knock your head to the wall. I mean, who talks like this? Yeah. Only a street thug would talk talk like this, not the head of a state, and it's, who it's, claims to be a Democrat. It's just uh, amazing. Yeah. Uh, you want to talk? You wanted to talk about uh, uh, the those villages, the Pashinya, that emptying. Yeah, I mean it's very upsetting. I'm getting so many phone calls from Armenians all over the world, saying, "How can we stop this? What can we do?" Well, unfortunately, when the leaders of the country in Artsakh and in Armenia already make concessions almost daily to our enemies, whether it's Azerbaijan or Turkey, uh, the, there isn't much we can do from so far away. <clears throat> Not only we don't have a power, we don't even have a vote in the country, all we can do is uh, talk and write and express our opinion even that they resent that we're expressing our opinion. They say you should not interfere in Armenia's internal business. Yeah. <clears throat> but but we, we talk every day about 
North Korea, we talk about Russia, China. So it's okay for us to talk about China, but we cannot say a word about our own homeland. It's and ridiculous. Actually, and on the other hand is, like for example, when I interviewed Haik Mardirosian, he was blaming diaspora. He says, you guys just give money or build school. You didn't put pressure on the government. You didn't said has to be somebody from diaspora in the government. He says, you guys did do nothing, you diaspora. So here you go, how do we play in this game with Hayastan? Well, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm all for pressuring the government, not just this government. I was also pressuring the other governments before, one-on-one -on -one sitting in front of them in the palace. So I, I'm, I'm all for pressuring. Uh, I'm not reluctant to pressure anybody, uh, nor I'm embarrassed to pressure anybody. But our pressure can only go so far. Now, all we can do is uh, criticize, talk, go on a video like you, or write articles, talk about it publicly. That's all we can do. Now, I had one more weapon in my hand before, which I don't have anymore. The, I had free access to the leaders before, and I constantly went to Armenia. I've been to Armenia 59 times. So every time I went, I would go and sit in front of the president, and sometimes the prime minister, sometimes the foreign minister, and others, and tell them exactly all the things they're doing wrong. Were they happy with me? They were not. But uh, they, they knew that I don't have a hidden agenda. I wasn't trying to undermine them or uh, ruin anything. I just want them to do their uh, job properly so the people will benefit. My yeah. ultimate goal was to help the country and, and the poor people who had no fault, <clears throat> they were just victims. Uh, unfortunately, now I don't have that relationship with Pashinyan. I only went oh. once once and talked to him in 2019, September when I was there. And uh, that's the only time I, I had one hour with him. <clears throat> but uh, that one hour did not result in anything positive, neither for him nor for the country. But I got to know the person that we're dealing with yeah. firsthand, which is important. And uh, since then, I've been very critical. So that tells you my opinion already. So the, uh, th there isn't much we can do with the pressure. If, if, if they want us to really be involved, which is something that everybody talks about for 30 years, but nothing has been done. And Pashinyan, when he came to power, like in every other subject, he kept saying, Oh, we need the diaspora. We need qualified experts from diaspora. We need to give them high-level ministerial positions to make a difference in the country. We, we, we need to involve the diaspora Armenians uh, in the homeland. Uh, he also said something dear to my heart and to your heart. He said that diaspora is so spread around the world that if you want to get the opinion of diaspora, who do you call? What num phone number do you dial? There's not a f single phone number to, to call. Uh, there are millions of phone calls, 7 million people, thousands of organizations. How do you find out? What do they think? And he says diaspora has to be organized under one umbrella. So I, I came up with uh, this idea, which I, I had it for years before Pashinyan, about forming the diaspora army in parliament. And I, when I met with him and I told him, and he, he, he was very happy with the idea, but, uh, and, and then, of course, we have the other problem in Armenia, Armenia besides Pashinyan, is uh, Zare Sinanian, the so-called High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs. And uh, when Pashinyan asked me to send him a letter uh, in writing explaining this uh, Diaspora Parliament plan, I sent it to him, and he said he will respond. To this day, three years later, he still hasn't responded. So when Zare came to Glendale, uh, and I knew him before. I met with him and I told him about it. And he said, I know nothing about it. So I gave him another copy of the letter to Pashinyan. And he went back, promised to answer. I, I didn't hear from him for a year. And then I sent him another letter, again, no answer. Finally, one of his secretaries sent me a press release as a editor of a newspaper. So I responded to, <laughs> to the press release saying, can you ask Mr. Sinanian what happened to my repeated letters, and ask him to respond. And finally, uh, he responded, and he said the craziest things. Uh, 
I mean, you know, it's okay to criticize what we all do. Well, nobody's perfect. But he said, no, this is wrong, and uh, I don't like it. Uh, you're not doing it the right way. Uh, we, will, we will think about it. Uh, and then he had told me that he's organizing a diaspora conference like we had for years. And for a while there was COVID, so they postponed it. But now the COVID is mostly over. Uh, you don't see a single person wearing a mask in Armenia, nor in the US. Uh, and we're now in uh, August, and the conference was supposed to be September next month. Obviously, they're not going to do a conference in one, one month. So th that didn't happen. Like everything else that they talk about doesn't happen. But Armenians love to talk. And uh, it's one thing for a regular person in the street to talk and do nothing. That's bad enough. But when you're the leader of a country or one of the leaders and you just talk and don't do anything, uh, that has a consequence on the country, negative consequence. I, so, you know, he's, he's not even giving a press conference, never mind all the other conferences. He's afraid. And you saw today, he waited all uh, 48 hours, whatever that things happened, 24 hours. And then he takes with all this uh, multi-million dollar security apparatus to go there and uh, uh, to look what, what is happening in there. You know, like, and he probably wept up all the people from there, stopped all the construction. Uh, I mean, construction, the... Uh, you know, people who is working, trying to save life, just for him to walk to show off. The man is a multi-million dollar show off man. That's how he run this, this a nightmare, you know. So, well, but, it's unfortunate because he does, he does not come from a wealthy background. He comes from a poor background. That's the problem. And then that's the problem sometimes when poor people end up in a power position and money position, then they go wild. Yeah, uh, They can't control themselves. So anyway, coming back to those uh, three villages, that's a very, very sad topic for all of us. Everybody's so upset. Everybody's scratching their heads, not knowing what to do. Uh, unfortunately, again, once again, we were talking, there isn't much we can do from the diaspora, except complain and criticize, which, which we're doing. I just wrote an article editorial this week in my newspaper uh, uh, condemning and criticizing the government of both Armenia and Artsakh for mismanaging this situation like every other situation they mismanage. And I, as, I, as I wrote, it's one thing, it's understandable when you lose a, a war that you, you're uh, bargaining from a weakened position. That's fine. That's what we understand. Uh, Armenia and Pashinyan cannot behave like a lion and uh, try to destroy Azerbaijan and Turkey. That's not what we're uh, asking. What we're asking is that they have little sense, listen to people who are experts, knowledgeable, consult them, listen to them, pay attention, and, and not, not to mismanage the bad situation and making it worse and uh, try to have uh, intelligent advice, follow the advice, listen. He doesn't listen to anybody, even if somebody tells him the right thing. And I know I sp when I spent an hour with him, I told him a lot of uh, th good things to him. He didn't listen to any of them, but that's his choice. He's the head of state, I'm not. But we're trying to help the country. It's, it's our country also, not just his. It doesn't matter where we live. We're all Armenians and we have only one homeland, that's Armenia. So now we, we have this mess, which I would like to go a little detail into because m most people do not follow the details. They just hear three villages being evacuated. So this all goes back to the uh, so-called, they call it a statement officially, a statement that uh, Aliyev, Pashinyan, and Putin signed on November 10, 2020. And in there, I don't know why, the uh, Pashinyan uh, agreed and signed uh, paragraph six of that statement, which says that they're going to uh, build a new corridor, uh, close down the Lachin corridor, and they don't say why. And they say that the Azeris will control that uh, corridor, reinforce uh, peacekeeping. And uh, most of the 
new road will be built by Azerbaijan and a small portion, I think 12 kilometers or 10 kilometers, will be built by Armenia. And furthermore, in the agreement that they signed, it says that the it, this will be done in the next within within the next three years. And the Armenian side even distorts that. They say Aliyev went ahead of us. He did it before three years, and he didn't have the right. That's not true. The statement says within three years. It also says that uh, they will make plans for the new road and and get the approval of both sides, which Aliyev did get Pashinyan's approval, uh, the plan for the road. And Aliyev built the road uh, because he's interested in closing the Lachin corridor as soon as possible in order to isolate Armenians from, in Stepanagert from Armenia. And that corridor, Lachin corridor, also has gas, electricity, internet. And so those things will be shut down in two weeks, in less than two weeks, on August 25th, when the, that corridor is uh, shut down and all the other utilities will be shut down with it. And the new link between Armenia and Artsakh, the Azeris, uh, they built it quickly, uh, within 18 months. And as soon as they built it, Aliyev gave an ultimatum to Pashinyan and to uh, Artsakh leader, leader, saying immediately close down Lachin and uh, use the new road. But the new road is only built uh, the section that Aliyev built. The Armenian section, which is a small part, Armenia did not even start building it. They only g gave the contract this month. And they say that it will take 250 days, a little less than a year, to build it. So until then, the new road cannot be used. The old road, Azeris will not allow. And to make matters worse, that there are three Armenian villages next to the Lachin Corridor which uh, Aliyev w demanded that they, the people of those three villages immediately leave the villages and have hand over the villages to Azerbaijan along with the Lachin Corridor. And these people who were told all along by Armenians official that we still have a couple of years, don't worry about it. All of a sudden they're told you have, you have two weeks and you have to get up. And, and, and do what? Where, where do you go? These people are homeless. They have families, children. They have no place to go. Already there are tens of thousands of refugees in Stepanagert with no place to live. And now there's going to be uh, people from three more villages with no place to go. And then the minister of Artsakh, Haik Khanumian, minister of territorial and infrastructure management, uh, tells the villagers don't you dare before leaving your homes to burn your homes yeah because he knows that in the past after the war in 2020 when armies were forced to turn over their villages and towns to azerbaijan they didn't want them to have their uh, houses so they burned them down so knowing that the minister tells the people listen don't don't you dare to burn your house because the government is going to give 10 million trams or equivalent of $24,000 to each family as compensation to find a new house someplace. They can find it with that kind of small amount of money. And then, but if you burn your house, you're not going to get any compensation. You'll be out in the street. Uh, now, th this is really another crazy thing, situation. I mean, it's one thing for uh, the, to lose to the enemy and be forced to do things against your will, but then to do crazy things yourself to make matters worse, uh, that I don't understand. So, the uh, uh, you know, I'm sure you've seen the video. I saw the video yesterday. I was depressed. Uh, this one father of family in uh, one of his three villages pours gasoline all over yeah. the house on his furniture and all the rooms and just burns it. Uh, even though he was told if you burn it, you won't get compensated. So uh, now I understand also that there's a law in Artsakh that says that if you're evicted from your house, 
the law allows you to get compensation because you're going to be homeless. The government is obligated to compensate you and to house you. So how is this minister telling people, if you burn your house, you're not getting compensated? That's a violation of Artsakh law. And it is granted that Artsakh is not a recognized republic, but those are the laws that people of Artsakh did, the government of Artsakh did, parliament did. And if we don't follow our own rules, how do we expect others to recognize us to follow our rules when we don't follow our own rules? So uh, on top of leaving the houses, not knowing where to go, getting compensation, maybe, maybe God knows when they'll get compensated, because it's one thing to promise compensation and another thing to get it. And uh, so these people are going to, you know, by August 25, they're going to leave. And a friend just called me right before the show and, and, and asked me, do you know why August 25? I said, I don't know. I assume that's a date. What, not assume, I, I know. That's a date that Ali have picked. And he says, you know why Ali have picked that date? I said, no. He said, because on August 26, the next day, is Ali have's wife's birthday. Yeah. And Ali wants to make a gift of these three villages to his wife. I don't know if that's true, but uh, it's uh, interesting, amusing, anything possible in this crazy world. So uh, I don't know what to do. There were some people called me last week trying to organize a telethon, a fundraiser, and telling these people in the villages, go ahead and burn your house. Don't worry about compensation. We'll give you the money. But... Uh, we need we need to organize a telethon, which is a lot of work. We also need a, a, a charity that uh, people can write the checks and get tax deduction because it's not just a few dollars. Uh, some people can be encouraged to give larger amount if they can deduct from their taxes. So nothing has been done yet, and I keep getting phone calls from a lot of people. Uh, the Coming back to the... November 10, 2020 statement or agreement, there are a lot of very confusing wording in there. Uh, I don't know why Pashinyan signed such a document. I know he was under pressure of the battle, and there's three of them, Aliyev, Pashinyan, and Putin. It, doesn't, it looks like neither one of the three can write a simple sentence that's clearly understood by, by the people. There are a lot of confusing things in there. Now, in the heat, heat of the battle, in order to stop the war and not lose more soldiers and more territory, I understand if Pashinyan hurries up and doesn't have the time to really understand everything, and he may not be happy with some things, but he goes ahead and signs it because he has to, to stop the bleeding. That I understand. What I don't understand, and there's no excuse for it, now a year and nine months have passed since the war. And Aliyev and Pashinyan, and sometimes Putin joined them, they have many, many face-to-face -face meetings. One would think that after all this time, all these hours and weeks and months, when they sit down together, there's, if there's anything unclear or confusing in the text, they have all the time in the world to clarify the confusion so that everybody's on the same wavelength, on the same ball. Mm -hmm. They didn't even do that. I mean, it's just one error on the top of another error, another error, it just keeps going. Every day we wake up, there's a new disaster. Yesterday was the explosion. Tomorrow there'll be shots fired by the Azeris on Arsakh villagers and kill the Arsakh soldiers. Next day, Azeris will sh fire shots at Armenia's borders and then kill Armenian soldiers or kill their, steal their cows and cattle and shoot at their houses on the border. Uh, and and uh, I must also mention something else, uh, going back to the agreement that Pashinyan signed in November 2020, the day the war ended. There's many, many problems there, but we'll spend hours discussing all of the problems. Let me just focus on two, two problems, two obvious problems. One is the first line of the statement says, this is a ceasefire. Now, ceasefire is a word. It's not a difficult word. It's not confusing. Everybody knows what a ceasefire is. There have been thousands of ceasefires in the history of mankind, thousands of wars, 
and they always ended in, in ceasefire or one country completely taking over the other country. Now, thousands of ceasefires, and yet the ceasefire that Pashinyan signed, there's no other ceasefire in the history of mankind a similar ceasefire. Ceasefire means both armies on both sides, wherever they got to during the war, when the ceasefire is announced, they stop on the spot where they got. They don't continue. Now, what does Pashinyan do? On one hand, he calls it ceasefire. On the other hand, Aliyev's army only conquered a s small amount of territory. After the ceasefire, Pashinyan gives over, turns over to Aliyev huge amounts of land that there was not a single Azeri soldier put its foot on it. The Kelbajar, Hadrut, everywhere, the, the, they were just still under Armenian hands and Pashinyan just turned over to Aliyev all these lands after the war, after the fighting had was stopped. What kind of a ceasefire is that? I've never heard of a ceasefire, have you? So this is why he doesn't do press conference because people are gonna ask those questions. This is what he's hiding behind this police barricade because there's a million questions like what you put it, there is in there. Was this war was designed, was engineered by him? You know, like for example, look at, look at this here when he went to, this was the first meeting when, with uh, Aliyev. Was they designed, engineered this war there? If not, what happened to this guy that was beside him? Two months later, he was dead, you know? So there is, there is so much in these things. That's why he doesn't want to give press conference. I know. He, he has uh, previously prepared questions, and then they go through and pick any question that to his liking. Yes. And then they have this girl from uh, Armenian public TV. She reads the questions. Uh, she tries to get him to answer the questions. Sometimes she repeats it, but he avoids uh, answering yeah. questions. And of course, if they were real journalists, like you said, in a press conference, they would do follow-up questions, which is very right. normal to any journalist. But there's no follow-up questions. He gets away with it. But uh, this last press conference, so-called press conference that he gave, uh, even when this girl told him on TV, uh, the, some of the press refused to send questions because they said, this is a joke, it's not a press conference, we're not going to send questions, we're not going to participate. And then uh, Pashinyan says, oh, well, if they come to my office to a press conference, what if they create a scene <laughs> and uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see, I, I haven't seen any press conference in all these years in Armenia or other places where uh, somebody creates a scene uh, that hasn't happened in Armenia. He's just afraid of facing the journalists. That's the real reason. Forget exactly. It, because he knows he committed crime and he knows his crime and he's afraid. And that's why he spent millions of dollars on uh, uh, police security. I mean, you could see, like, where is that? Uh, did you see this? This multi-million dollar uh, security car I had somewhere here, but um, yeah, I, I I don't know where where did I put it, but yeah, uh, it's uh, they, he just signed a new law last week, where he's creating a, a new ministry, ministry oh. of Inter interior. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it says the purpose of the ministry of interior is to protect the safety of the officials, among other things. Yeah, there you so, go. So as if we don't have enough thousands of police protecting him, now we have a whole ministry, and now we need new troops, new bonuses, new salaries, new expenses, just to protect him. Yes. So no wonder our borders are unprotected. Absolutely. Uh, the, coming back to the November 10, 2020 agreement, uh, I mentioned the first thing, the nonsense about ceasefire, but, but there's a, a second point, which is even more important, that Pashinyan messed up. He goes ahead and signs as the prime minister of Armenia 
to turn over to Aliyev, to Azerbaijan, a whole bunch of lands that uh, doesn't belong to Armenia. Pashinyan has no authority to sign away Kelbajar or Hadrud or, or, or any of other areas that he, he signed to give away to Azerbaijan. This isn't his father's house that he can give his chair or toys to anybody he wants to. That's his own privately owned stuff. This, is, this belongs to the Republic of Artsakh, the, their territory. And if somebody wants to give it away, it's their government who has to sign and say, yes, I agree. Pashinyan didn't even ask them. He just sat there and signed the document and all these lands were turned over. And the yeah. poor leaders in Artsakh are too weak and too ignorant to uh, put up a uh, defense against uh, uh, Pashinyan. Ha Harut, my friend, do you know how many years took First Karabakh War? Do you remember? Yeah. Six years. Took six years. Azerbaijanis would come and they'll go, you know, so they eventually they were victorious. Six years. Syrian war is 11 years. You know, people don't just give up, go into war and says bleeding or this and that. This is all BS. This, this Armenian people have to understand this was engineered war. This was designed and planned to fail. You know, I don't know if last time I showed you this, this, uh, um, what is his name, Hovanesian, the guy who was the spokesman for military. Uh, if you want, I could run it, you could hear it. I mean, it's very clear the guy says, he says, we were prepared on the 8th until 12 o'clock in the morning. We were prepared to go in to, to liberate and fight until, <coughs> <coughs> until, until spring, he said. We were prepared. Let me run it so that you could hear it, okay? Dukasume <laughs> 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 Uti Ola, Mink, Katal, Mink, Haka Hartsakum, Shushin Hedverest Nelu Haka Hartsakum. Ambuch Ola, Ambuch Amsi Ute, Aravutit, Minchev Kes Gishel, Minchev Tasibus Rosro, Minsk Shame Ilkus Chigdem, Inni Zorkerum, Yershushi Shajaka Komerab Zorkerum. Եվ <gülüyor> Shushin vs. Nagan vs. Then is coming. Kill Pahu Meng. Shushin hating vs. Iran's jogat nere varon ke galen Shushin makreleng. Yes, akan jis meche minche vesor. Pashtun chan banaki heda manatar. General lieutenant Azumaniani. Udumen hiatsakan espes tantagin zaykuitse donen daviti. Te inchpes uti ora haika gan zor kere. Other 
Okay, so do you hear that? Did you hear all that? Do you see what he says? They were not prepared to surrender. That's what he said. They're just the opposite. He said, but we were winning. Yes. We were victorious. We were celebrating. I mean, I mean this is the guy who was informed. He had all information from for all the military. He was on TV every day. He was talking. I mean, I heard these stories from many, many, many soldiers. They didn't believe it on, on uh, November 11th what happened they were shocked so this is why i'm saying this this war was engineered designed by pashinian aliyev to fail there is no one could stop a war i mean I, I have another one i don't have it here next time i could show you he is interviewed by another guy said we created this uh, turkish drone fear in our heart there was no such thing. In fact, the same guy says the worst drone was the Israeli drone. There was multiple different type of drone, uh, Israel. They did more damage to us than uh, things. So Pashinian propped up this uh, Turkish drone, Turkish drone, where Turkish drone was in Syria, was in Iraq, it was in Libya. Nobody knew even about it. So this, this Pashinian is Turkish man and I just don't know how to make it people understand this, you know. I mean, we, I, I follow these generals. I follow all those soldiers, what they say from that time, this was planned. And also, Pashinian, he goes secretly signed this document without consulting the president, his foreign minister, his parliament. I mean, it's all this written are there this conspiracy stuff, but your turn. Let me just add uh, two, two important points. One is that uh, if we had that investigative committee in the parliament or a committee of experts, including international experts who would be much more objective than Pashinyan's parliamentary followers, if we had a, a professional, objective investigation we will find out a lot of things that we don't know right now and we can guess. That's the first point. The second point is, Pashinyan became prime minister in 2018, but Pashinyan did not all of a sudden appear in Armenia. He's been an editor of a newspaper for years. And now people are reprinting and revealing all the stuff that he wrote in the past. Yes. And, and I've, I've been following them. At the time, I didn't read his uh, paper. But since then, since he's become prime minister, and since he has a cer certain mentality, that mentality didn't get created now. He's had it for a long time. For example, in, in one of his articles, uh, he wrote, years before he became prime minister, he says, Artsakh or Garapal, is a burden on Armenia. Hmm. The sooner we get rid of this burden, the sooner we can live better. So with that kind of mentality that Artsakh is a burden, of course, you're not going to defend the, that territory. You're not going to protect it. You're not going to uh, make sure that it, the enemy does not take it away. He's already in his own mind. Years ago, already he is more than willing to give it away. But back, the, back then, he could only write. He couldn't give away anything, even if he wanted to. He was just a journalist, and a yellow journalist at that, not even a regular journalist. 
Yeah, he's a tabloid which journalist. I, which I respect. Now, the, uh, when he became prime minister, that idea was still in his head because it's the same man. His mentality didn't change. So now he can actually do things to move that along. And the last few months, every time he's come to parliament where he's said things, he keeps saying all sorts of things, very close to saying, I've given up on, on, on Artsakh, mm -hmm. very close to it. Yeah. He, says, yeah. he says international observers or powers are telling us to lower the bar on our uh, yeah. defense of Artsakh. When, when he was asked, who's the one, can you give the name of anyone who's told you that? There's no name. He just, he just makes, it, makes it up that international forces want Armenia to give Gharap up. And then I remember it was, I think it was in the middle of the war, he appeared in parliament and they asked him about the war and he said, well, even if we're defeated, we'll declare ourselves to be the winner, which is another crazy statement. I mean, if you're defeated, you can declare yourself, yeah, if you're mentally, uh, not sound, you can say those things. If you're defeated, you're defeated. If you win, you win. A defeat cannot be a victory. Even if we lose, we're winners, he says. It makes no sense. But he, he says things like this on a daily basis. He said it for years, long before he became prime minister. He continued saying it. It's one thing for a journalist to, to be wrong, to, to write crazy things. We can ignore it. But it's another thing for a prime minister to say such things because those things have a consequence on an entire nation, yeah. not only the yeah. nation of Armenia, but also the Armenian nation, 10 million Armenians worldwide. Uh, it, it's, it's depressing to, to see what's happening. You know, Harut, I said, I'm always going to say, this guy will never leave, never. I don't care all this protest. If you put even 100,000 people in their protest, this guy will not resign, will not leave. This guy only way if the Armenians convince the military to do it. Yes, we heard a lot of this saying, oh, if it's military involved, it would be bloodshed. What well, already there is a bloodshed. There's already 5,000 people blood spilled. There is already every day and border blood is being shed. You know, so what blood they are talking about, you know, I don't understand. Is the Armenian people to ask the military to take over, arrest this guy and his thugs. And then they could put him on trial, find out all this stuff we're talking. But with the protest, it's, I, I put every dollar I have, they cannot make this guy to resign. Even if he'll resign, he still have his thugs in there. Those people are not gonna resign, you know? And so uh, it's, the military is only solution, and Armenian has to convince some of those uh, generals to take an action. Well, <laughs> even that didn't work when the general, uh, the chief of staff issued a warning to Pashinyan to resign, and then nothing happened, and then 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 Pashinyan had the general fired. Well, so, I'm not talking yeah. about writing a letter. I'm talking force. Right. That that they didn't do. They didn't do it. I mean, Egypt, they did. They, they knew Morsi was Turkish thug, and uh, uh, they overthrew it, the counter-revolution. And uh, look at now, Egypt is a stable country. But Armenians have to talk to their generals to say it's time the country been destroyed, and so we need this idiot to be removed, period. I don't think there is any other way. Uh, you could you could protest until hell freezes. They should even change their protest. They should protest right in France, Armenian military headquarters. There, where so those those, those generals can hear it, you know. But but me, you, other writing, complaining ain't gonna help. To be honest with you. I agree. We because we wrote. We did everything. We could hear, like I just show you one in millions of those generals who tell the truth. You know, we heard this. But what is use hearing it? What is use even a general tomorrow 
comes or any soldier comes says, oh yeah, I will. I heard Pashinya says we're gonna destroy Karabakh. He's he's not gonna leave. It doesn't matter what one or two, three people say. We need military uh, take over, removing this guy because he's destroying the country. Well, obviously he doesn't want to resign because he knows the consequence. Oh, of course. Resigns. He will be arrested, tried, yes. and uh, as as to reveal all sorts of secrets. Uh, so that's why he, he's not going to resign. Well, I, you I, know, his he um, was uh, he was sentenced to seven years in jail, and he just did two years. And stupid Sarkisian uh, give them amnesty. So he he knows, he knows his his uh, what's going to happen to him. I mean, Armenian could probably. Uh, pay, Take him a piece, as you know, in the street. He can't walk even in the street. And so military is the only solution. I think all our talk, our things has to be concentrated, encouraging Armenian people to ask their generals, at least, I mean, I, you could see all those generals sitting in there. I mean, I, I had some video uh, stuff, but I don't have it here. I mean, they're sitting there obeying this guy. It's just like Armenia is a normal country. Yes, if you are in the U.S., it's a different story. But Armenia is not a normal country, you know. And so the general had to act, you know. But we'll see. Well, maybe next time we should interview one of those generals. Well, I wish. I wish we could find those generals. Uh, I mean, you saw one of them. Uh, that he just gave him a, a couple of dollar raise, and he was one of those 25 who uh, wrote a letter, but then now he's chief of the military. So that's hopeless. So we have uh, we have uh, three minutes. So you yeah, say what you want. Well, I, th I think we spoke long enough. I know. Uh, I don't yeah. want to prolong it any longer. Yeah. We said the most uh, critical breaking news stuff but I'm sure when you wake up tomorrow there'll be a, a new crisis new development new things to be upset over and yeah, it's yeah. very frustrating because we can't do anything about it sitting so far away and not only because we're so far away even those sitting in Yerevan can't do anything about it yeah and at least they're not doing anything about it I'm sure they can do some things but uh, Anyway, it's it's very upsetting, frustrating for Armenians in Armenia and outside of Armenia. Yeah, so so maybe maybe because well, let's talk about you know your parliamentary system, the Aspora Parliament, and maybe this uh, uh, Pan Armenian was Pashinian idea, put them all together to silence them. I I just don't know. Like I'm just guessing uh, because why they're not talking, you know? So. Well, I, you know, I, I tried. I, I, uh, I, I formed a committee. We, we've been meeting every week for the last four years. I went to Armenia, talked to Pashinyan, talked to other people. And that's another problem we have. Even when you have a good idea, and <clears throat> if people don't, don't disagree with you, they agree with you, even then you have a problem because they just say yes, 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 and nothing happens. Yeah, because yeah. we have become a nation of talkers, not nation of doers. Yeah. So talking is not going to do anything. Uh, in Armenian, there's an expression that says, "Hoskov pilav chepvish." You can't cook pilav with just words. You yeah. need, you know, rice and uh, oil. Yeah, so, and and also there is there is another word like that in Armenian it says, "As pilav dashat churguzi." <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, Armenians are good in those those things. But Armenians in diaspora everywhere, they really do a great job. I mean, I don't know, you've been in Beirut, Anjar. They took it from swamp to build a city. They have their own police, their own schools and everything. Uh, there are many, many of those examples. I just told you in, in uh, Jerusalem, like how Armenian quarter for 1,200 years. So in, in Western Armenia, more or less, we do things really uh, good and right. You know, we have our screw up, 
But in Armenia, it's just like they hate each other. This is the problem. This is, I mean, the reason they have 35 party because they hate each other. How do you unite those people? Anyway, so I gotta go. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Harut. It was uh, again great conversation. So we'll talk to you maybe soon or next week again. Take care, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.